Well, it seems like Tesla has finally achieved the impossible dream. They have been upgraded from junk status for their stock to investment grade. What a shocker. Plus, in earth-shaking news, AI large language models have learned how to train themselves, and that's going to be a game changer. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I'm doing a two-parter here. I know a lot of people are only really interested in the Tesla end of things, so I'm gonna put the Tesla stuff first and then I'll talk about the AI thing. But I recommend sticking around for the AI thing because it's actually super important. Anyway, let's turn to this Yahoo Finance article that's titled, Tesla Exits Junk Rated World After Moody's Upgrade. So in case you didn't know, even though Tesla has just been killing it as a business, their stock has still been rated as a junk status until October with S&P 500 stock rating and now finally with Moody's, they have also upgraded it to investment grade status. So let's read the article. And if it sounds like I'm somewhat cynical about this entire thing, I am. I mean, this, these ratings are actually kind of ridiculous anyway, but it's worth talking about because it's going to have a significant effect on the stock. Anyway, let's read some parts of the article. Of course, I'm going to leave a link to everything down in the description so you can check it out yourself later. So the blue highlighted line says, now credit rating providers playing catch up, <laughs> hint, hint, are giving heft to the auto Maker's blue chip valuation. Moody's Investor Service on Monday became the second credit ratings firm to endow Tesla with investment grade status, upgrading the Austin based firm's credit score by one notch to BAA3. It follows a similar move by SP Global Ratings in October. And by the by, if you break down Moody's rating systems, it is an absolute nightmare. I don't know. It practically takes a PhD just to understand exactly what the hell the rating systems are. Don't know why they can't just have one star through five stars or you know, something much, much simpler than that. I, I feel like almost that they make these rating systems somewhat opaque to make them sound really complicated and make themselves sound better, right? Or more intelligent because they're giving these crazy ratings instead of just giving it a one star or something like that. Anyway, continuing on, quote, Tesla will maintain its position as one of the leading manufacturers of battery electric vehicles as the company further solidifies its global footprint, end quote, Renee Lipsch, senior credit officer at Moody's wrote in a statement. Skipping ahead, Tesla was already being treated like a blue chip company by many investors and analysts. It secured a $5 billion revolving credit facility earlier this year, a sign that it was nearing investment grade status. The electric vehicle firm has little outstanding debt and its five-year credit default swaps are already trading in line with high-grade borrowers, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. And then finally, I'll read this last little bit. Quote, it's a historic event for Tesla, end quote, said Joel Levington, a Bloomberg intelligence credit analyst. We continue to believe the rating upgrade cycle for the company has legs, potentially narrowing views of credit risk against Volkswagen. So a couple of things here. I don't think it's a historic event for Tesla. Tesla, I don't think could care less about this. Us, us shareholders, I guess it matters because now that they're investment grade, more, you know, big financial institutions that have to check a box of investment investment grade stock to invest will now invest in the stock. So that should push it up in the short term a little bit. It doesn't really matter for those of us who are holding it for five years, but it's also incredibly ironic that they talk about narrowing the credit risk against Volkswagen. This is a company that is going, I, I can't even remember, it's like $100 billion in debt. They're going to be spending something like $192 billion to fully shift to electrification of their vehicles over the next five to seven years. We're looking at a company that is massively, massively in debt versus Tesla, which has very, very little debt. They have revolving debt, you know, because obviously, Obviously, you have to buy things so that you have to have some credit out there and stuff. But in terms of long-term debt, they have almost no long-term debt. They're actually such a rock-solid corporation compared to any other auto manufacturer that they are kind of in a world of their own, which is the reason why we retail stockholders have been buying the stock a lot. So anyway, what you'll probably see is a short-term bump in the stock as investors, you know, people who will only do things when you've checked these investment grade stock boxes, invest in it, and you'll probably see a rise in Tesla stock. And then over the long term, it's really going to have almost no impact. So a historic event is really, you know, incredibly unimportant. Now, if this had happened in 2018, 2019, when Tesla was much more cash poor and needed to be able to take out loans and things like that, yeah, this would have mattered a lot, but it is very unlikely, unless Tesla is going all in on something really, really crazy, that they're ever going to need to borrow a lot of money long-term again. So this investment grade status is actually rather 
inconsequential and unimportant to Tesla. So that's my opinion. Of course, I am not a financial analyst. This is not investment advice. Do your own research, all of that kind of stuff. But my feeling is this is historic for people on Wall Street, but for nobody else. And now turning from something that you can tell that I feel is rather inconsequential to something that is massively consequential. This is about Stanford's new Alpaca software. This is something that they did in a couple of weeks for around $600, which is rather incredible. And the author AI explained here is really, really, you know, very intrigued about the fact that Stanford is able to do this for such an inexpensive price. But I actually have a slightly different take. I'm not going to play clips of this video for you. I will leave again the link to this in the description so you can watch it. I highly recommend watching it. It's just a 10 minute video. It's very, very quick to watch. No big deal. Uh, but it does go into exactly how Alpaca was created. The important part about Alpaca for me is not so much the cost of the creation, but how they did it. So how did Stanford train a large language model in just a few days for $600 that cost hundreds of millions of dollars for OpenAI and other competitors to program and create just months ago, right? And GPT-4 just came out. So, so how did this happen? What happened was Stanford was able to take Meta's neural network model Llama, and they used the smallest version of this, which is only less than 7 billion parameters, I think 6.4 billion to be exact, maybe 6.7. Anyway, a very, very small model compared to the 174 billion parameter GPT-4. GPT-3 and at a guess 500 billion parameter GPT-4. Anyway, they, they used that and then they used the GPT-3 API to create prompts to train Llama. So essentially what they did was rather than having human beings in the loop, which is the way that these things have traditionally been created traditionally in the past couple of years. Anyway, it's an immensely complicated, time consuming and expensive task. What they've done is they've allowed GPT-3 3.5 to actually create the prompts to train Llama to make it really, really good. Now, it's only 7 billion parameters, so this, this alpaca is not fantastic, but there are versions of Llama that go up to about 65 billion parameters, and of course there's GPT-4 right now. So if Stanford redoes this, and the odds are that they probably will, you know, honestly within just a couple of weeks we'll probably see this, but if they take the, the high-end version of Llama, which is about 10 times more parameters, and they train it with the newest version of GPT-4 rather than the GPT-3.5 that they used to have, the odds are that Alpaca 2 or whatever they call it is going to be substantially better than this version of Alpaca that they trained. And it probably won't cost them much more money to do it, especially now that they've figured out how. So we're looking at something that is incredibly inexpensive and very, very fast to train and can be done on existing models. So Stanford didn't in in invent anything new. They didn't invent any new models or anything. All they did was bash the two of these things together and allowed them to train on each other. And the AI training itself is the part that is game changing for me. The cost is actually really, really cool and very interesting because, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars is something that most companies can't even afford to do. But the fact that they're using AI to train itself is, you know, my, my head went, oh no, <laughs> this is where things really, really start to change. So if you don't know some, a little bit of history, like AlphaGo from DeepMind was a program that took a really long time to program and create with a lot of human intervention. And that was the program that finally beat, was it Lee Sedong? I, Lee Sedong? Sorry, I'm misremembering his first name. Anyway, it beat the world champion Go player in in 2016. <laughs> Again, I'm just doing this off the cuff if I'm remembering. But that's not the important part. The important part is that it was better than a human player. But then what DeepMind did was they allowed it to train on itself and it suddenly became so much better than human players that humans don't even really understand how it works anymore. It, it, it plays the game of Go at such a level that humans don't even really understand or comprehend how it's playing the game. So that's that exponential curve where you're seeing a lot of work and a little bit of progress and then the moment that the switch that gets flipped is when you can train AI on itself. And the way they did that was they had it played, you know, trillions of games versus itself. So it would just play itself, play itself, play itself. And whoever won and lost it would, it would keep, you know, increasing the ability of both halves of the equation. 
And this allowed AlphaGo to become way, way better. You know, you hit that, that steep part of the exponential curve and it suddenly became way better than any human being. So what I'm predicting is going to happen here with Alpaca is that now that people understand you can do this, there's going to be a plethora of, of people out there who are going to go like, oh, let's throw AI at itself with large language models. And suddenly we're going to go from very expensive, very slow training, which takes months or years, to really, really rapid iterations. So just cast your mind forward a few weeks or months or something like that. And imagine that we get Alpaca 2 that's trained on, you know, Meta's Llama model. And by the way, Alpaca Llama, by the way, <laughs> get it. Anyway, so take the 64 billion uh, parameter Llama model. You train it with GPT-4 and you get Alpaca 2. You get something that's, that's pretty substantially good. Then you take that model and you then retrain it with GPT-4 or you throw something else at it, another AI-versed model. And and you increase it, and then you use that model to train a new model, right? So you take the new alpaca, you move that into the position of the trainer rather than the trainee, and then you train another large language model on it, and then you take the results of that, and you move it over into the training part, and you train another large language model, and you've got this virtuous cycle where this stuff can train itself at an exceptionally high rate of speed. So what we could be looking at is, rather than these large language models being the end-all and be-all, as people are thinking about right now and having our minds blown, with what these things can do right now, we could be looking at in as short as six months to a year, these things being so exponentially better than they are right now that we can't even comprehend them anymore. They provide information and they write in a way that is superhuman in a way. I don't even know what that means, honestly. I'm not, I'm not sure what superhuman writing and language communication actually means. The best I can think of is, you know, being like an Einstein in the sciences and a da Vinci in the arts and engineering and things and, you know, that kind of thing, but having all of that at once. But I think that I'm thinking too small. I just don't even understand that. It's sort of like, you know, when you look at at, at uh, Go, at the way that the AlphaGo can play itself and it can play a game, and we humans can't even really comprehend how it's playing the game anymore, just the fact that it's crushing any human being. I, we could get to the point where these things are so good that we don't even really understand what they're doing anymore. And that could happen in the space of six months to a year. It could be incredibly fast. Because if you combine very inexpensive prices to train these things, plus the ability for the AI to train itself, when all you're looking at is computer time and the thing can just cycle through very, very quickly and there's not a lot of human intervention, we could be looking at superhuman language stuff. I don't know what that means exactly, right? And again, we could be looking at generative art the same way, things like that, because now GPT-4 is multimodal. It's able to take in uh, text, but also images and video and audio and all of that kind of stuff. So if we start combining multimodal with the ability to train itself, this could take off really, really fast. So if you thought 2022 was the year of AI, I'd say buckle your seatbelts and watch what's coming. And don't forget, of course, that Tesla's full self-driving could very well get to the point where it becomes better than human beings this year as well. So we could be looking at real world applications of AI also going exponential and getting to the point where it is significantly better than humans. So where does that leave us humans by the end of 2023? I don't know. We might be a little bit humbled by then because we might be very, very clearly second in a lot of these categories. Now, one quick caveat before I sign off. Remember, this is this is AI. This is AGI potentially. It is artificial general intelligence. It's something that has a general intelligence. It knows a lot about a lot of things. It is not artificial agency, artificial intelligence agency or AIA or AA or whatever you want to call it. It's not an artificial agent. It doesn't have desires of its own. It don't, doesn't have its own motivations. So however fancy these hammers get, they are still just hammers. It's human beings who are motivating it forward and telling it to do things. It doesn't have a will of its own. So right now, at least that's where we are. I don't know if it, you know, if it achieves enough complexity, there is the possibility that it could gain some form of consciousness. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's where it could get really scary. And I don't know, given how exponential this growth could be over the next six months to a year, I don't know what might happen. Consciousness just might be an emergent aspect of, of complexity. So we could start to see something very, very complex and it could at least fool us into the fact that it's conscious. But right now, at least, I see AGI as, as taking off and really becoming quite the thing. 
but I see consciousness or, or artificial agency as something that still doesn't exist yet. That's only in science fiction. So no worries about that yet. Just worry about the fact that this thing is going to be better than us humans at most tasks very, very soon, it looks like. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and thought-provoking, perhaps a little bit terrifying. <laughs> I do. I'm honestly a little bit worried about all this stuff considering how fast it's going. Anyway, if you did enjoy it, please do like it so other people can find it because YouTube's more primitive AI algorithm needs Needs that. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. We've had a really interesting discussion on Discord about these kinds of matters. And if you want to join the team and join the discussion, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.